there. I'm Dr. Nicole Ross, and today we're going to be talking about um, the low vision examination and integrating low vision care into your practice. Um, so first, I kind of want to spend the first part of the talk going over what is low vision um, and what are the characteristics of the patients uh, worldwide that have low vision. And then next, um, we're going to go over some of the different diagnoses that these patients have and also, most importantly, how we manage low vision. And I do want to mention that we do have another webinar um, on the topic of low vision devices specific to management on February 22nd, in which we'll um, develop on this point further. So what is low vision? These are patients who have permanently impaired vision in both eyes that causes functional limitations. Um, so these are patients who have been through all necessary medical treatments and medical interventions, um, and their best corrected vision still remains um, reduced from that perfect 6-6 or 20-20. Um, many efforts have been made to define uh, visual impairment and low vision in different categories depending on the visual acuity in the better seeing eye um, and may also in some cases be defined in terms of field loss in patients who have peripheral vision loss but remain to have good acuity. So we think of patients with six over six as having normal or perfect vision. Um, in most places in, in the world, six over 12 allows you to drive without restrictions. And then at between 612 and 660, we consider a patient being visually impaired or low vision. And at 660 and beyond, uh, we start getting into the definitions of legal blindness, either the US and North American definition or the other WHO definition, which is six over 150 or 2,500. So in terms of how the WHO groups uh, visual impairment and low vision categories based on acuity, we can see from this table here. Um, and we think of uh, grouping people in terms of moderate, severe, profound, uh, low vision. Um, and the reason for grouping people this way is because these patients will have different uh, visual needs and different functional demands. And so today, the focus of our talk really stems from this highlighted box here of patients with moderate to total vision loss is sort of our discussion today and in incorporating and managing these patients in your practice. So low vision is really a consequence of an aging population in most places, certainly in North America and the US. Um, if we look at citizens over the age of 40, um, the prevalence of low vision was estimated to be 2.4 million and the annual incidence well over 400,000. And this is expected certainly to rise as estimates for 2020, um, which is only two years away. Uh, worldwide, the picture is a little bit different, and this is from work from the WHO. And in work from the WHO, certainly they cite that cataract and uncorrected refractive error are leading causes of low vision and visual impairment. But really, when we're focusing on the definition of low vision, we're, we're talking about uncorrected, um, we're talking about corrected uh, visual acuity and we're talking about uh, visual impairment that cannot be corrected further. So I've actually taken uh, uncorrected refractive error and also cataract out of the graph below. So here in this graph we're seeing causes of low vision from macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, trachoma, and other um, causes. And we can see we have our Asian uh, countries grouped in red, um, our European and North American countries in green, Latin America in purple, and Africa in orange. And as you can see in all of the countries, sort of surprisingly so, perhaps we have a higher incidence of macular degeneration causing moderate to severe low vision in the North American and European countries. But overall, there's, there's not too much uh, variation as we might have expect uh, between these categories. If we look at WHO's uh, definition of blindness, so these are patients whose best corrected acuity is 2,500 or worse, um, and looking at their diagnoses, Again, I've taken out um, the uncorrected refractive error and cataracts because those aren't really 
low vision cases and just focused on the other ones, we again see um, that macular degeneration has a high prevalence in the European and North American countries, but also surprisingly in, in Asia and parts of Latin America as well. Um, and again, while these um, numbers are higher, it sort of shows you that across the globe, we are all dealing uh, with similar issues. Um, so I want to answer and bring up this next poll question of which of the following cases meets the definition of severe uh, low vision. So would that be uncorrected acuity of 612 or, or 2040, as we say here in North America in the better eye, um, reduced acuity uh, due to cataracts of 2200, reduced best corrected acuity of 2200 in the better eye due to macular degeneration, or uncorrected uh, visual acuity of 660 in each eye. Great, so I think we're all um, on the same page here. The correct answer is in fact C. So I just again wanted to use this poll question to sort of stress the point that we're really talking about cases of low vision where patients have permanently reduced vision that cannot be corrected further. And then we're classifying them based on their best corrected visual acuity in their better eye. Um, oftentimes patients might say things like, oh, I'm legally blind in my right eye without glasses. And really that, that doesn't quite meet the definition of low vision that we're discussing. And that's a common uh, misnomer. So if we look at the provision of low vision services worldwide, and this was done by Jill Keith and her group, um, and we can see that, that areas in white um, have no coverage of low vision services. Um, some of the, the light dots have really limited services provided. Um, in the hashed areas, less than 10% of the population has access to service. Um, in the cross, uh, between 11 and 50% have service, and that certainly is our case in the U.S. So certainly um, we're aiming to increase access to low vision services, which is a huge priority. Um, and then we have more of the darker shaded areas, um, which is in my home country of Canada, <laughs> with greater than 50% coverage, um, and one uh, nation in, in Europe there as well. If we look at who provides low vision services, there certainly is a range of providers that are providing the services. Some are optometrists uh, like myself, um, but others may be from the educational field, um, ophthalmology, uh, rehab teachers, um, etc. But even with including all of these providers, we still have um, reduced access to care that is less than ideal worldwide. If we look at some of the barriers of access for patients with low vision, um, you know, some cite uh, cultural barriers worldwide, um, cost in terms of devices and different visual aids that would help assist patients with the visually mediated tasks that they need to do. Um, certainly there's this notion that nothing further can be done and certainly while nothing further might be able to be offered surgically, the patient gets the message that there's nothing else out there to help. And so that is a barrier that I think all of us uh, health providers can help address. Um, you know, distance and travel uh, for patients is a huge um, issue because many of these patients cannot drive themselves, et cetera, because of their reduced vision and are relying on others and family members uh, to take them to appointments. Um, if we look at the common presenting complaints of just our low vision patients, um, this was a review that we did while I was at uh, Wilmer Johns Hopkins looking at all of the low vision patients and their primary visual complaints upon entering the low vision appointment. Um, reading was by far the number one complaint uh, followed by others. And this certainly is true worldwide. While it might not be reading specifically, um, there's a high prevalence of difficulties with near tasks, whether it's sewing, crochet, um, and other near tasks that tend to be the number one complaint. 
So in terms of assessing a low vision patient, certainly our um, visual measures that we do in every ophthalmologist called exam are important, a visual acuity. Um, I would add contrast sensitivity to that. Um, knowing where scotomas or blind spots are on the visual field has a tremendous impact on a patient's functional ability. And refractive status is obviously important to make sure that we do know in fact what that best corrected vision is, even in a patient with a lot of pathology and ocular disease. We want to also look at more functional measures of reading fluency and really a goal-based case history. Uh, the goal of low vision rehabilitation is not necessarily to improve the vision, but we're improving the patient's ability to do visually mediated tasks. So we're looking for a lot of different workarounds, whether that be training, whether that be uh, rehab teaching, whether that be a low vision device um, to assist them but we're really sort of helping them with visually mediated tasks. So we need to know what tasks are important to them because any uh, prescribed therapy or device has to be not only appropriate in terms of the amount of magnification, contrast enhancement, and lighting provided, but it also has to be practical for that patient to do the tasks that they need to do. Um, and a lot of self-reported ability and, and talking with the patient and counseling is required in really getting that history. Um, there's also overlying cognitive measures that we have to sort of consider, especially in our older population. Um, we won't get that into that much today in today's talk, but there are a lot of different screening measures that are available because um, certainly the cognitive capacity of the patient is going to affect your rehab plan and what you suggest uh, for the patient. So when I'm asking a um, low vision case history, it's a little bit extended um, than the typical case history of an eye exam. Um, I think about the five sort of functional domains of a person and how vision affects those domains. So I ask questions with respect to reading or near tasks. I asked questions about uh, visual information or sort of general seeing. So this would be, for example, questions about facial recognition and things like this. Um, mobility is a tremendously important question. We know that in reduced visual acuity, mobility and fall risk um, is a concern. Um, I ask up questions about their activities of daily living or ADLs as we commonly abbreviate this. Um, so cooking, cleaning, managing, them, um, dressing and so on. Um, and also uh, driving if appropriate if the patient was previously a driver or is a driver. So what, what do I ask with respect to reading? So there's a lot of variety in terms of near tasks and reading um, to ask a patient that you would really want to know. Um, you would really want to know what the favorite reading materials is. Are, they, are these large print magazines? Is this a small printed Bible that they're trying to read? Um, was a patient previously an avid reader? Is, is continuous reading the goal? Um, or, you know, does the patient simply want to make out a food package and what it is. Was this the sodium-free Campbell soup or, or not? Um, what about the habitual reading distance? Um, is the patient adamant that they, they must read at 40 centimeters with the newspaper on the desk? Um, or are they flexible? Are they willing to hold things closer? Are they willing to adjust that distance? Um, for all patients, the ability to complete spot reading tasks, uh, you know, about the microwave dinner packages, instructions, uh, medicines, et cetera, is, is important. So we always have to address those. And then the question is, do we also have more complex needs in the workplace um, or for pleasure reading that we also have to manage? So visual information, we're asking the questions about can the patient um, recognize faces? You know, this is a particularly uh, sensitive point um, as many of my low vision patients are fearful uh, answering the doorbell because they're not sure who is at the door. They can't recognize the person um, or they get into awkward social situations where uh, they feel that they might be ignoring uh, someone that they know who's entered the room because they can't readily recognize the face too quickly. 
Uh, watching TV is another area in question. You know, how big is the TV? How close do they sit to it? Um, in, coincidentally enough, many studies have shown that low vision patients actually watch more TV than their normally sighted counterparts. Um, so TV is an important question. Um, glare is also an important question. And a lot of ocular pathology, light scatter is a problem. Um, so glare sensitivity can be a problem indoors, outdoors, and it's important to tease that out. With respect to mobility, we want to know, does the patient use any mobility aids currently? Do they use a support cane? Do they use walker? Do they use a long white cane? Um, do they have a relevant fall history? And how many falls have they had? How often? What are the details of what happened? You know, was it curb detection a problem? Um, was it stairs? Was it uneven pavement? When we're talking about activities of daily living, we're really talking about the home safety um, of the person. We will really want to identify any home safety issues, um, such as burning themselves or the food when preparing meals, um, being able to manage their medications appropriately, not taking too much of something or not taking medicines at the appropriate time with instruction as instructed. Um, what their living situation is, do they have support from, from family members um, who can help with some of these activities of daily living, um, or, um, or do they, are they on their own? Um, do they use a phone or computer? You know, mobile phone use is highly prevalent worldwide. Are they able to dial the phone in emergency? Are they able to connect with loved ones? Um, do they have any other safety measures, such as a life alert or, or something that, you know, if they fell or had an accident, that they could reach out to somebody? Uh, driving, there's a lots of important questions here, and certainly driving regulations really vary wildly worldwide um, as to the vision requirements um, needed uh, for driving. Um, and some countries have no, no stipulated vision requirements for driving. But as their, uh, as their doctor and professional, we want to give them good advice with respect to driving. Um, so we really want to know when, where, and why they're driving. Um, if they've had a motor vehicle accident history, um, do they have active licensure or not? Assessing visual acuity in patients with low vision there are certainly a lot of different choices. Um, you have your traditional sort of electronic and cell and projector chart. Um, you have the ETD arrest chart or the fine bloom um, chart. All may be appropriate at different times, but I would say my strong preference, if at all possible, is for a logmar chart. And the reason being is that this chart has uniform size progression um, and, and it's a logarithmic uh, progression in metric, um, and as a Canadian, I, I like metric, and most of you worldwide probably do acuities in metric, so it's, it's easier um, to handle and also convert to our dioptric measurements when we're calculating magnification. Um, each line on a logmar chart is 0.1 um, unit, log unit smaller than the previous line, and you really can adjust the chart easily. So I have my logmar chart on a rolling cart. Um, so I know if I move the chart from two meters to one meter, I expect the patient to improve by three lines. And if I vice versa move the chart from two meters to four meters, um, I expect the patient to perform three lines worse. And so a logmar chart does allow you to measure acuities at four meters, two meters, and one meter. So those three uh, distances are common used. And so you can measure vision up to uh, the 2600 level. Um, if the vision is worse than that, then we unfortunately do have to go to a fine bloom uh, chart, which is pictured here, um, which can be done at any distance um, as, as long as you are consistent. Um, the logmar charts typically work well um, with European or Eastern European letters. Uh, they, the Sloan letters were used to calibrate this chart. 
Um, for, so for other languages, what is commonly used are the Landolt C rings um, on the Logmar chart uh, to get the same um, calibrated measurement. Refractive error, um, after measuring acuity, we obviously want to know what the best corrected acuity is after getting an entering acuity. Um, and many of my students uh, and interns ask me the question, well, the patient has a lot of pathology here. Is it worthwhile doing the refraction for the patient? Um, and so in order to give an insightful uh, comment to their question, um, this uh, excellent uh, retrospective review was published by Janet Sunnis, um, and she looked at over 700 of her low vision patients, and she was looking at which patients improved and benefited from a refraction despite their ongoing pathology. Um, and she found improvement of two lines or more of visual acuity in about 81 patients, or 11%. Uh, 3% of her patients improved uh, four lines or more. And when she stratified things by diagnosis, looking at who were the patients that improved the most with a the refraction, um, these were patients with macular degeneration, uh, myopic degeneration, which perhaps makes sense with progressive myopia, and also patients status post uh, retinal detachment, especially if they had a scleral buckle, which then would elongate uh, the eye, making the eye more myopic. So those were the patients that benefited most uh, from a refraction. In doing refraction in low vision patients, and I know uh, Dr. Sarah Wozniak has a webinar planned up ahead to discuss trial frame refraction more specifically, um, we really want to use large uh, changes that the patient can notice. Um, so I always sort of start refraction with a retinoscopy, even if it's just over the habitual glasses to know how far off the mark are those habitual glasses. Um, and you know, I also have to think about uh, the patient's pathology, how likely there's gonna be a change in refraction. Um, and maybe if there's other reasons uh, to repair the glasses, I especially want to make sure I do a refraction. And so with low vision patients, you're going to do a loose lens uh, refraction in a trial frame, um, which worldwide is more common than the four opter anyway, but you're really going to use large lens changes to make sure the patient knows the difference between choice one and choice two. Um, and obviously you're going to use this larger differences between lenses when the acuity is much poorer. And the common uh, rule to pick our bracket sizes that we use is the just noticeable difference rule. Um, so this rule implies that we take the denominator um, of the Snellen uh, fraction and that becomes the just noticeable difference. So for a 2100 patient, they have a just noticeable difference. They'll notice differences of one diopter. So I want to choose two lenses that are one diopter apart. So in this case, that would be the plus or minus 50 would be one diopter apart. Um, and then um, for you know, a 2200 patient, conversely, that would be a just noticeable difference of two diopters. And so we're showing the patient a plus one and a minus one lens, and that is two diopters apart. And similarly, when we're testing for astigmatism, we want to keep in mind that just noticeable difference in the same way. So we're going to use a handheld Jackson cross cylinder and we're gonna pick the power of that Jackson cross cylinder based upon that just noticeable difference calculation. Um, the next step really in the exam after we've um, it tested entering acuity, we've now got a best corrected acuity and refraction is really to test contrast sensitivity. Um, I really like the MARS uh, chart and this is available in numbers in addition to letters. It's easy to store, it's done at 50 centimeters. Um, and as you can see, each letter on the chart, um, it decreases in contrast. Um, 
if you don't have a contrast chart available, you still can get a sense of the patient's um, contrast sensitivity function with some really pointed history questions. Um, so patients with poor contrast sensitivity will have a lot more difficulty seeing facial detail because a face tends to be uh, low contrast. Um, they'll often comment about difficulty seeing stairs or steps, especially if the edges are not marked. Um, they'll often comment about tripping on uneven ground. They may report there's an overall haze in their vision. Um, and they also may report that they can't read any digital displays or analog clocks are, are very difficult when you have very poor contrast sensitivity and very washed out vision. Um, so you can get a sense if a patient does have severe contrast sensitivity loss through those pointed questions. Uh, this is a table that I particularly like in terms of quantifying um, contrast sensitivity loss. So for an older patient, between you know, 1.6 to 1.48 uh, log contrast sensitivity is really near normal. Um, you know, when we get around one uh, log unit, we're, we're talking about moderate contrast sensitivity loss. Um, and then less than one, we're talking about a very severe loss reduced by a factor of six or more times compared to normal. And then at, at 0.48, this is really profoundly reduced uh, contrast sensitivity. If we talk about reading specifically, there are three measures that are really important to gather from your patient to help with their reading or near task goals, which tends to be the number one complaint of patients. That will be your visual acuity measurement, knowing the best corrected acuity, because that will determine how much magnification is required for that patient to, to read. Um, contrast sensitivity is probably the second most important measurement because that gives you a sense of how much lighting or contrast enhancement is required. And then also a measure of central scotomas or visual field. Um, because if you have a blind spot in the center vision, like many patients with macular holes or macular disease, um, then you need more magnification than you would anticipate based on their acuity alone because they have to read around this blind spot that is going to cover up part of the word. So when we talk about estimating magnification for a near task, I often um, use continuous text reading cards like the MN read, um, because that really will give me a better sense of how the patient is managing, especially if they have central scotomas um, that they are, have to read around. Because a patient with a central scotoma will have better letter acuity than near than they will have a reading acuity. Um, so let's kind of talk about principles of magnification now that we've kind of gone over those three essential elements of the exam that you need to do to, in order to address um, a near complaint, which is what we're talking about today since it's the most common complaint for low vision patients. Um, so there's options for magnification. Certainly we've all thought about relative size magnification, you know, taking the size of something and making it bigger, you know, putting... Um, reading a large print book or putting something in the photocopier and enlarging it 200 times or 200 percent so two times we also talk about uh, relative distance magnification so these are patients that move quite close um, to objects in order um, to make them bigger or to produce a bigger retinal image so that is also another form of magnification and if we talk about um, relative distance magnification, this is also relatively easy to calculate. It's we're comparing the two sizes. So the original um, distance to a new distance. So if a patient was reading at 40 centimeters and, and couldn't read or manage something, um, but then moved it to 20 centimeters, we would say that they um, are producing or getting an effect of 2x magnification. So relative distance magnification is always compared um, to some standard distance. 
when we talk about, you know, well, how do I figure out what low vision aid to prescribe for a near task, I tend to um, veer away from the term uh, magnification and tend to think about requirements in diopters. Um, I, I'm an optometrist, I, I like diopters, and also there's tremendous variations between manufacturers of magnifiers um, in terms of how they label things. So a five diopter magnifier could be labeled as 3X and it could also be labeled as 2X or even as 1X, um, depending on the manufacturer. So really um, looking at the dioptric need of the patient and the dioptric um, requirement for the magnifier uh, tends to be a much easier approach to manage. And there really are several approaches uh, to calculating this. So these are the four uh, rules that we think about when we think about determining equivalent power or FEQ as it determines uh, of a magnifier that's needed. Uh, we can use Kestenbaum's rule. We can use the inverse of the near acuity method. Um, we can consider the acuity reserve rule or, or we can consider my personal favorite, which is um, the inverse of the critical print size. So let's go over these briefly. So Kestenbaum's rule um, dictates that the required um, equivalent power um, needed for a patient is determined by their best corrected acuity at distance of their better eye and taking the reciprocal of that to get a dioptric value. Um, and this would be the dioptric uh, value required uh, for the patient to read 1M letters on a near card. And this is equivalent to most countries' newspaper uh, print size. Um, so regardless if you do Snellen or if you do a metric acuity, you're basically inverting the acuity. So if we have 6 over 30, um, we would divide 30 by 6 and we would get 5 diopters as the equivalent power required um, for near tasks for that patient. Now, there have been many critics of Kestenbaum's rule, and the primary critic is that many of our patients have macular disease, whether it be through diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, um, or some other pathology. And patients with macular disease tend to do better on a distant chart and then on a near chart. Um, and they also uh, tend to do better on a near chart than a continuous text chart, which is why the last uh, part is my favorite. But the near acuity um, method dictates that you take a uh, near acuity with the appropriate near habitual near addition for it to allow the patient to see the card if they're, um, if they're presbyopic. And you would invert that, and that would give you the dioptric equivalent power needed uh, for reading 1M print. Um, so, for example, if the patient read um, 2M on this uh, New England College of Optometry near card at 40 centimeters, um, we would record their near acuity as 0.4 over 2.5M, and we would invert that near acuity and get a value value of 6.25 diopters um, that is required for near magnification. And that can now be the tentative uh, new ad. So you can prescribe a much stronger uh, reading prescription for this patient. So rather than a standard near addition, you could may perhaps prescribe the plus 6.25 uh, near addition to provide enough magnification to allow them to read small print. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this method has also been criticized. It is better than Kestenbaum's rule. It kind of gets you closer to a good um, starting point in working with your patient with a, a near magnification solution. Um, but many have criticized it that it's using a threshold acuity um, and not very many patients like to read um, at their threshold. And so, Lovey Kitchen and others propose that um, the acuity reserved for peak reading efficiency is usually two times the threshold uh, for most people. And so using the acuity reserve rule, they propose that you take the value that you get from these other two rules of Kestenbaum or even the near acuity method and you double that value. 
Um, so in the last example, the near acuity method dictated that we needed 6.25 um, diopters for reading one and print. And the acuity reserve uh, rule dictates that, well, to read 1M print comfortably and fluently, if fluent reading is the goal, then really 12.5 diopters is required. So double, double that initial value. Um, but I, I think that really ultimately the best way, um, if you're really if the goal really is continuous reading, the best way to assess this and get an accurate calculation is using a continuous reading card. Um, and Gordon Legg uh, developed this card, the Minnesota Reading Test, and it is available in multiple languages, English, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese. It's been calibrated by many studies. It goes from very large print sizes to very small print sizes. And it's also available as an app if you're a tablet user on the iTunes store. Uh, you can use this link to purchase the apps. And as more languages um, come online with the Minnesota Reading Test, they are looking at more and more languages every month. Um, they are available through the app. Um, so with using a continuous reading card, how do I determine equivalent power um, required for a near task to read one in print? Well, really, I have um, to determine what is the critical print size is of the patient. That is, what is the smallest print that this patient can read at their maximum reading speed? And so really, the following steps are required. I have the patient wear an appropriate spectacle um, correction for the test distance. So if, if the card is at 30 centimeters, I make sure they have a plus three near addition if they're presbyopic. If it's a child, um, then, you know, whatever their best corrected um, glasses for distance are, are appropriate. Um, I ask the patient to hold um, where the, the card is in best focus. I have the patient re start reading from the very, very large print sizes, and I note um, what their maximum reading speed is, sort of even if it's just sort of a, a, a general um, sort of sense, whether it's slow, moderate, or fast. Um, and then I really listen to when is the last print size uh, that they read fluently and when they started to slow down. And that really is their, their critical print size, is the last print size that the patient read fluently. And then I also note uh, their threshold. And so when uh, calculating um, the equivalent power using this method, I'm really using the critical print size and inverting that. So if the critical print size, the last, smallest print that that patient read fluently um, at a test distance of 30 centimeters is 2.5 M, I divide 2.5 M by the, um, the 30 centimeters, um, and that would give me a requirement of about eight diopters for that patient to read 1 M. And so once I've got this number, um, regardless of the method you use, that's really your starting point. And now you have to decide, are we going to prescribe a near spectacle that's quite a bit stronger maybe than the typical near spectacle prescription? Are we going to prescribe a hand magnifier or are we going to prescribe a stand magnifier um, type system? So this is my next uh, poll question for you, um, just to make sure we're all following along. Um, so this is a 30-year-old patient with an incoming diagnosis of ocular cutaneous albinism uh, presenting to your office present complaining of reading complaints. Um, you do the um, MN read test and you find that the patient is holding the card quite close um, at 15 centimeters, but they are able to accommodate um, to that distance as they're only 30 years old. And they rapidly read most of the card, but they start to slow after 1.3 M and then they're unable to uh, read any text past a 0.5 M. So what is that critical print size from the above reading assessment? Oh, 
All right. So, so yes, the critical print size is um, uh, 1.3M, but actually to record um, an acuity, that actually is the test distance um, over um, the print size, so it actually would be C. Um, the people who picked B um, were eager to get on to the next step, which was calculating uh, the equivalent power required from this value. Um, so they already were a step ahead um, of the question. The other thing that's really important to determine um, during a reading assessment is really optimal lighting and its criticality. Um, I usually select an initial lighting level based on the patient's history, usually with a um, gooseneck lamp that's about two to three feet away in front of the shoulder of the better seeing eye. Um, and then I sort of, once I've determined the critical print size, I ask the patient, is it easier with the lamp, you know, really close to the page, at three feet overhead? Um, and you'll have some information from the contrast sensitivity test as well as to how critical lighting is. Obviously, the lower the contrast sensitivity, the more critical it is. But the point I want to make here is often patients will ask me, should, based on my contrast sensitivity test, should I be replacing all the light bulbs in my house? Should I have LED lighting only? And really, um, the bulb isn't the most important piece, but it's really the distance that you're holding the bulb from the page. And that has to do with the physics of the inverse um, square law. So if I bring a light source three times closer, it's going to be nine times brighter. And so really the intensity and the distance is the most important factor. Um, and that's really what you want to communicate to the patient. Um, so now that we've sort of got a handle of how to determine equivalent power, we now have to make some decisions about what is going to be the best choice uh, for a low vision aid for reading, which is what we'll focus on today. Um, so these are sort of our three main optical categories of choices, and that is um, glasses, a hand magnifier, or a stand magnifier. So in this example, um, I have a patient here um, with their slightly um, hyperopic refractive error. Um, the better eye is about uh, 2040. Um, unfortunately, on the, on the reading assessment, their critical print size uh, was quite large print, 3.2M. So if we invert that, we are getting about an 8 diopter requirement for them to read 1M. And so if I am prescribing a near vision only reading glass for this patient, eight diopters is going to be my new near edition. And I'm going to, uh, when I'm writing a near only prescription, add eight diopters to the distance refraction um, up here. And so this would be um, my near vision only prescription. Um, now, with at plus eight um, near edition, that's quite close for a near point. You know, the patient's going to have to bring the material quite clo close. Um, and if the patient is reading binocularly, it'll be hard for them to sustain convergence to, to read quite close. Um, you can even try it yourself. So you could consider some base in prism uh, to relieve that that convergence demand. Um, and typically, uh, we would prescribe 10 base in um, for an 8 diopter um, near addition. Um, prism half eyes, um, if you don't want to do sort of a custom uh, near vision only glass, prism half eyes are available sort of off the shelf by many um, low vision aid vendors. Um, and they, they look like this. Um, and Certainly, I would say that this uh, allows the patient to read binocularly as much as possible by having that base in prism to relieve um, the near demand. Um, but I would say that once we get to the very high powers of like plus 14, even with the prism, it's hard to really sustain convergence. So at that point, the patient really is reading uh, with their better eye. The important part in prescribing really strong glasses like this is the patient has to be aware of the reduced uh, reading distance that is now required with these very high near additions. Um, and sometimes patients can be quite resistant to this adaptation, especially um, if they're really used to reading um, at 40 centimeters. Um, but one um, 
sort of benefit of this way is that, that glasses really will give the patient the widest field of view um, because that magnifying lens is right at the spectacle plane. Um, and they also, if they're using eccentric viewing, can use that eccentric viewing port and sort of move the page along. Um, so it is a, a good hands-free approach. So there's advantages and disadvantages with all devices. You know, certainly the advantage here is that it's sort of normal to use spectacles, um, the wide field of view. You can really customize this for your patient who has a lot of astigmatism and so on. But there's also ready-made options available at a lower cost. Some of the disadvantages, obviously, are the close working distance, especially the higher the dioptric requirement, the closer the distance will be. And if the patient needs a light source because of a reduced contrast sensitivity value, it can be hard to get a light in on the page and hold things close. Um, and really, binocularity is limited, even with the use of basin prism, if we're going stronger than plus 10. Um, so here's our next poll question for you. So you have a patient, Ms. Magnus, and, and she's saying that she doesn't want to use her magnifier anymore to read. Uh, after refraction, you conduct a reading assessment. You note the critical print size is about 2.5 M at 33 centimeters. Calculate uh, the equivalent power that you would need uh, to prescribe her magnifier. Excellent. So we're all on the same track. So the FEQ would be um, uh, 7.5 diopters. Certainly, um, there's not a lot of magnifiers out there that are that specific. So certainly the people who uh, picked eight diopters, you know, probably the eight diopter magnifier would be the closest to that value uh, that you would pick. Um, now here's a, a next question. Um, say that this patient um, actually wants uh, prism half eyes, uh, ready made off the shelf near reading glasses um, to read. Um, so we calculated her FEQ in the previous question is 7.5 diopters. Um, she's got a slight hyperopic refraction of plus 50. Um, what prism half eye glasses um, off the shelf uh, would you assess primarily? Excellent. So um, the answer is B. Um, so plus eight with 10 base in. So typically off the shelf um, prism half eyes, the amount of base in prism in them is usually um, uh, two, a difference of two from the, the, the dioptric value is sort of the cheat way I remember it. So, um, you know, plus eight has 10 base in on each lens. Uh, plus 10 has 12 base in on each lens, plus 4 has 6 base in on each lens, and so on. So that's sort of the typical uh, pattern that we see from manufacturers. Um, so now, given um, these, these spectacles that Ms. Magnus is wearing, uh, the question is, what is the near point? So how close does she have to hold the paper from the spectacle plane uh, when she's using these glasses? Great. So one little caveat here that I, I meant to sort of catch and point out. Um, when we're prescribing um, glasses for the patient, so the patient's wearing plus eight glasses. So if she um, had no refractive error, uh, 12 uh, centimeters would be the near point. But since this patient does have a bit of refractive error at distance, um, just by a half diopter, um, the near point is actually 
you know, equivalent to the near addition that that patient is getting. Um, so it actually would be 13 centimeters or slightly off from 12 in this case. Um, so just sort of a reminder to consider uh, the patient's distance uh, refraction um, when we're prescribing these off the shelf um, devices. So when we talk about uh, magnifiers, um, handheld magnifiers are a very common approach to prescribe in low vision. Um, definitely understanding the goals of the patient will help you determine the most appropriate magnifier. Um, certainly we calculate FEQ for 1M, but if the patient really wants to read a medicine bottle that is much smaller print, then we sort of have to adjust our calculation. Um, we also have to really consider the trade-off between field of view and the power of the magnifier. The stronger the magnifier, the less the field of view. And that's where that calculation of equivalent power is handy because it sort of prevents us from over-prescribing too much power. Um, so many of my patients do have two to three different hand or stand magnifiers of, of different um, powers. And I often, you know, sort of in the office, work with one that's right at that FEQ value, um, one a little stronger and one a little weaker to really tease out, you know, what is this patient using the magnifier for and how do I have to adjust my goal target print size for that? Um, so in this patient that we, we had previously with their refractive correction, um, you know, we determined that the FEQ required for this patient was eight diopters. Um, so in the previous example, we went down the glasses and spectacle route. Here, we're going to go down the mag hand magnifier route. And so I would start, and with this case, the FEQ I calculated was eight diopters. I would start with an eight diopter handheld magnifier. Um, and so handheld magnifiers, as we know, these are plus lenses that are used really mostly for brief spot reading tasks. Most patients are not going to read War and Peace with a handheld magnifier. And there's certainly a huge range of powers available by a lot of low vision vendors worldwide. And you can have illuminated um, for patients with contrast sensitivity loss and also non-illuminated versions. Um, the most important point to in part on the patient here is that they have to hold the object or the paper um, one focal length away from the magnifier. So the stronger the magnifier, the closer they're going to have to hold that magnifier um, to the page. And so, um, you know, I do have some videos available um, on this point. Um, and so if you're interested, please feel free to contact me and I can, I can share these videos with you um, that you can use um, as ed educational pieces. Um, hand magnifiers, certainly it's familiar, but it does require a lot of good hand control um, and does have a smaller field of view compared to spectacles. A stand magnifier is another approach. These are magnifiers that are held flat on the page. Um, because you're placing the plus lens at a fixed distance on top of the print, um, some add or accommodation is required for these. Um, commonly, we think about paperweight or dome magnifiers. These are prescribed a lot in children, um, and mainly because they have very short image distances, so patients can use a lot of accommodation if they're used to using a lot of relative distance magnification um, to use these. Um, you know, sand magnifiers, again, they're, they're great because you can drag them along. Um, they don't require a lot of hand control, um, but they the amount, the distance that a patient can be from their hand magnifier depends on how, what glasses you're prescribing. Um, now, when you're prescribing stand magnifiers, and we'll talk a, about, a bit more about this in February 22nd, so this is just sort of a teaser, the equivalent power um, that you get from using a stand magnifier is a combination of the enlargement ratio provided by the stand magnifier and the near addition you're prescribing for the patient. Um, you have to make sure that the near addition you're prescribing is coincident with the image distance of the stand magnifier. Um, and all low vision vendors, most of these actually um, list what the enlargement ratio is for their different stand magnifiers so that you can look it up. Um, if 
you find that your manufacturer um, in the region where you're practicing does not uh, list what the enlargement ratio is, I can um, show you and I'm happy to email you about uh, what the steps that you can take to, to make sort of a, a, a little bit of a lab bench to figure it out. Um, so for our patient, you know, we really are looking in this column here, this is sort of by, from Eschenbach, which is one low vision vendor, um, and we're looking at the enlargement ratio of these different magnifiers. Um, I just want to briefly mention some of the electronic approaches. We talked about opticals today. Um, a CCTV, which is a video magnifier, um, are prescribed for all ranges of visual impairment uh, nowadays, and there's many different features. One of the most um, common features is it does provide a very wide field of view of the screen that you can't do with optics. Um, and it does, as shown here, really enhance the contrast of the print um, on the screen. So here it's even inverting uh, the print so you have white text on a black background. Um, many of these have an XY table so that you can move the text on the table um, and also allow for autofocus. This equivalent, if you're thinking about equivalent power, this would be the same calculation that you would use for your stand magnifier. Again, we'll go over this more on the 22nd. Um, and typically, I use sort of a two-ruler method uh, to determine how, what the patient is doing um, to enlarge, as they enlarge print on the screen. There are also portable versions of electronic magnifiers, and these are very popular, mainly because the cost is reduced and also the footprint in the home um, is reduced. And many also have speech output, will speak aloud um, the text as you're reading it in many different languages. Um, so here you can get excellent stamina, a great field of view, not so great if you have motion sickness. <laughs> um, and the high cost sometimes is prohibitive for patients. Um, many of my patients are also using Kindles and e-readers. Um, these also can read out aloud to you. Um, many Kindles can have large print up to 2.5M um, and can invert the contrast. iPads, you can go a little bit higher to 3.2M on these, you can enlarge the print more. Um, so you may want to prescribe maybe a higher near edition um, for these patients in glasses, um, but maybe not quite um, as high as if the requirement was 1M. Maybe you want to um, cut it back a little bit, give them a little extra reading power so that they can read large print on their tablet. Um, disadvantage here is obviously the internet connection requiring Wi-Fi and that many of the menu uh, buttons uh, might not be in large print despite uh, changing the settings. Um, so how do you start? You know, here are some suggestions for some equipment to start practicing low vision. I would say, you know, a log mark, a uh, acuity chart, a contrast chart, an M notation continuous reading card, a measuring tape, so you measure what distance the patient is holding that card. Because as you can see, that affects your um, magnification requirements considerably and a trial frame set. Some of the low vision aids, um, I'd recommend having on hand some handheld magnifiers, stand magnifiers, prism half eyes. Um, next lecture, we're going to go over telescopes and filters in a bit more detail and an electronic um, magnifier. So thank you so much, and I'll take questions. So Dr. Ross, we have two questions so far. If you want to stop sharing your screen. Sure. It should be up top. If not, I can stop sharing. There you go. So if you open the Q&A box, uh, there's two so far. Great. Oh, so this question, um, but two questions by, from Dr. Shaw. What are the device for um, handicapped children who are studying? Um, so, you know, there, when we're t talking about um, patients with multiple disabilities, um, the strategy for magnification uh, becomes a little bit more complex. And oftentimes I find for um, children in this situation, we're looking to adapt the environment um, appropriately. So um, 
for these children, a lot of the times I'm recommending much larger print sizes. So I'm using that critical print size measurement or even a near acuity measurement and taking account um, the acuity reserve rule to suggest um, print sizes. Uh, for the patient, or if the patient's not reading print, but they're using, uh, looking at pictures, they're using Meyer symbols on a communication board, we want to make sure those symbols are large enough for them to appreciate. Um, depending on the ability of the patient and um, their ability to coordinate their hands, um, sometimes a dome magnifier can work quite well, um, or if the patient um, doesn't have much use of their hands, um, sometimes we can prescribe a higher reading addition, but we just have to make sure a caretaker or someone's with them so that they can adjust um, what they're looking at to the appropriate distance that it has to be. Um, um, the next question is, um, uh, a power calculation if of near if glasses are plus four for near. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think there's a bit more detail to that question that I'm not sure I'm capturing adequately. But if the, the question is if the patient has a distance refraction of plus four, um, what near glasses would you suggest? Um, well, I would basically um, suggest near glasses based on that FEQ calculation. So if it determines that I need four diopters um, to read the 1M print size, then I have to add that four diopter requirement to my distance prescription. And so my near glasses would be a plus eight. Um, the uh, next uh, question, um, I want to know your preferred technique of refraction in low vision, retinal degenerations, and corneal opacity. So my preferred um, refractive technique would be a trial frame refraction, especially for retinal degenerations. And using large uh, steps, um, using a just noticeable difference rule, so showing the patient large enough differences that they can choose between lens one and two, um, and that you can kind of consistently uh, have a trend there. Um, for corneal opacities, um, trial frame refraction is still helpful if glasses are the ultimate goal. Um, I think keratometry also can have tremendous value too in, in determining refraction for a patient with a lot of corneal opacities. Um, but ultimately, you may want for a patient with corneal opacities, if they could tolerate a scleral or a contact lens, you may want to do a trial frame refraction over an initial contact if sort of contacts um, down the line are something you're thinking about. Um, now the next question for refinement, um, do you choose objective or subjective refraction? Um, so most of the time I'll start with my objective refraction of retinoscopy, uh, and then I'll complete the subjective refraction in the trial frame. Um, so for example, if the patient with my objective retinoscopy findings is um, 2200 or 660, I'm going to, uh, choose lenses uh, that are two diopters apart. Um, so I'll probably choose a plus one and a minus one and show those two choices on my best sphere check. Um, and then as the acuity improves, um, the lens bracket size will decrease. And similarly, when testing for astigmatism, I'm going to pick a handheld JCC, again, based on that just noticeable difference rule. So if at by the time I get to testing their astigmatism after best sphere, um, if they're now 2100, I would probably use the plus or minus one uh, JCC um, to refine things, or sorry, the plus or minus 50 um, JCC to refine things. Um, now, oh, the next question um, is uh, this asking again about the near prescription. Um, and they've clarified that they're talking about a patient um, who has uh, no refractive error distance but has a, macular, um, has a macular disease. Um, 
you know, plus four for a reading prescription for a patient with macular disease may not be enough. It, it sort of depends on um, their acuity level. So I would measure this patient's uh, near acuity if you can with a continuous text reading card or even just with a, a near card. Um, and based on that acuity, I would invert it and that would give me the diopters required um, for, for a reading prescription. Um, uh, one comment here, uh, that, that requesting uh, more lectures on, on clinical optics. Um, so thank you for that feedback. And so on February 22nd, I'll be sure to integrate more clinical optics when we talk about all the different low vision devices um, and the different demands um, of patients. Um, next question is, what are we doing if the nystagmus um, is on both eyes um, and the vision was 660 with and no refractive error. Um, so I would take the same approach with a patient with nystagmus. It's still reduced acuity, um, so they're still going to require a lot of uh, some magnification. Um, the difference here is a patient, if it's truly just congenital nystagmus and there's no other retinal finding that's causing the nystagmus, their contrast sensitivity is going to be quite good. Um, so the criticality for lighting and other things isn't going to be as high. Um, so really you're prescribing magnification based on those four approaches I outlined. Um, is glare testing or a, like the bright acuity test a must for the low vision patient? That's an excellent question. I think um, the BAT or the bright acuity test um, can be helpful for a low vision patient to sort of quantify the glare. But most of the time, I think the assessment of glare and the treatment for glare is a fairly subjective thing. So I'll ask the patient to describe to me um, what conditions they're having most difficulty in. Is it bright sun? Is it indoors and fluorescent lighting? Um, what is the situation? And then I'll take the patient into that uncomfortable situation and we'll trial different filters of different tints and different densities. So I have a um, in the clinic a assortment of sort of fit over glasses that fit over top of glasses that control for glare that have top shields and side shields um, that are pretty similar that to shades that are given to patients after cataract surgery but just have different colors and a lot of different densities. Um, the other thing I have in the clinic is I have um, trial lens rings of all of the different um, colors available, all the different tints and, and at different densities and we'll also trial it that way and I'm basically um, relying on the patient to give me feedback as to what tint and what density resolves their complaint, but still gives them enough vision to make sure that they can navigate properly because we don't want to make things too dark that, that now they can't you know, see well to navigate. But excellent question. All right, Dr. Ross, I think that's a good place to stop since there's no more questions. Great. Thank you again, and we look forward to your next lecture. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.